to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In an attempt to criticize the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his critics gave him one of the greatest compliments you could ever imagine. In Matthew 11, verse 19, they said of Jesus that they accused him of being a wine-bibber and a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Friend, Jesus is indeed the greatest friend, a sinner, one who is living in sin and desires to be saved, has ever had. And those words beautifully illustrate that idea. We welcome you today to our study of more about Jesus. As we think about His nature and His character and who the Lord and Savior Jesus really was, this series, series is designed to help us live more faithfully and follow more closely our Lord Jesus Christ. As always, we want to welcome you to our study of these great lessons from the Bible, and we hope that you will always strive to turn to God's Word and give your attention to His will and His desire, not the desires and passions of men. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church worldwide. If you would like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons, we encourage you to visit our website. You can also call us or contact us through mail. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From this website, you can order our videos and audio of our lesson, as well as there being a host or good variety of Bible study material. There are articles, there are study questions, there are a multiplicity of things you could look at that would be helpful in your study of the Word of God. We also want to encourage you to visit the Lord's people, the Church of Christ, in your community. Maybe you've been wondering, what is the Church of Christ? What's it all about? Friend, we encourage you to visit these people. We can promise you that they are people who love the Lord and love His church. And as always, they'll strive to help you come to a better understanding of God's final revealed will for mankind. In Matthew chapter 11, verse number 19, Jesus begins to comment on the people of John's generation and those who really didn't listen to John who was indeed a great servant of God and he goes on to say, well, what am I going to liken this generation to? And, and as he think about their fickle, their mundane nature, he's reminded of some of the things they said about him. Of the Son of Man, they said he's a wine-bibber and a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And while they meant that to criticize, to deride Jesus, to make Him look less like the Messiah and the Savior, how true it is for the person lost in sin who wants to know God, who wants to be saved, not someone who's living in sin and doesn't have any plan of changing, but for the person who's lost in sin, Jesus is indeed the greatest friend they could ever know. In fact, the reason He came was to save those who are lost. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 paints a beautiful picture of Jesus as the best friend that the one who's lost in sin has. Uh, this text tells us a, a great deal about the character of the Lord. You know, Jesus is there with those who the, the society didn't want anything to do with, the worst of society. And some are going to say with, about Jesus, how is it that He can be the Messiah? He's not over here with the religious elite. In essence, He's down in the slums with the tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus will say, he did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In fact, he'll go on to say, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, Jesus uses a, a, a very interesting sense of logic and irony in his teaching. Think about it this way. Let's say you wake up tomorrow and you say, man, I feel great. I'm on top of the world. I think I'll call up to the doctor and make sure everything's okay. You better get this checked out. I feel too good. Well, you wouldn't do that. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, Jesus 
The friend of a sinner came to save him and ultimately release him from that sin. And so why is it? Let's think about this idea. Why is Jesus a friend of sinners? Friend, as you think about this idea, if Jesus had not been a friend to the one in sin, he would have been friendless. You ever thought about that as Jesus walked upon this earth, he's the only one who didn't have sin? Hebrews 4.15, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Who committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth? 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22. Jesus, had He not been a friend to those in sin, would have been friendless. For all of us desperately need Jesus, the friend to the one in sin. Think about Romans 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. Paul, what do you mean by that? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 8, verse 46, the Bible says there is none who does not sin, uh, even the righteous sin. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 29. That's something that we all have to face. And so thank God that Jesus came to this world, that He was the greatest friend one who's lost in sin does have. And friend, I'll assure you, that includes me and that includes you. Ezekiel 18, 4, The soul who sins shall surely die. I've been in that place of spiritual death because of sin. You've been in that place. Our sins separated us from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, God who is of pure eyes that behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness was separated from that, that one who's in sin. And the salary, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23, and so we, we rejoice in the idea, we're excited in the idea that Jesus came to this earth, that He did live as a friend to those who are in sin in that He made the greatest sacrifice that could ever be made. Why else is Jesus a friend of sinners? Friend, Jesus is the friend of the sinner, the one lost in sin because of His great love for the lost. It is the love of Christ that motivated God to send Christ to the world, Christ to come to the world, and ultimately the plan of salvation to be made. You're probably very familiar with the verse. Listen to it again. God so loved the world. He gave. His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's God's love that motivated His Son to come. And friend, it is the love of Christ that made salvation available. Paul said in Romans 5 verse 6, While we were still without strength, in due time or at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can't we say with the beautiful words of 1 John 3 verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called children of God. And it's that love, that love of Christ for those in sin that motivates us to want to serve God each and every day. Have you really ever stopped and thought about just what Jesus went through? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. It's that love that compels us to live every day for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But friend, as we think about the why, why is Jesus a, a friend of sinners? Friend, Jesus is that one who deeply cares and loves those in sin because they're the ones He came to heal and to save. You're reminded again of Mark chapter 2. The religious elite, the pious Pharisees and scribes and the Jews, they're thinking to themselves, if this is our Messiah, we've got a big problem. Because instead of being over here with us, He's over there with the tax collectors and sinners. And they, they deride Jesus. They say, why are you over there with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus vividly said, those who are well, they don't have need of a doctor, but those who are sick. 
I came to call the, the sinner to repentance. And so, friend, Jesus is the friend of the one in sin because they're the very people Jesus came to save and heal. The one who thinks he's right, he's going to have a hard time really turning to Jesus and submitting to his will. But the one who knows he's lost in sin, that's the man Jesus will be happy with. I'll give you an illustration. Luke chapter 18. Two men go up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stands and prays thus within himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, a murderer, adulterer, whatever it may be, like this tax collector. I give, I fast, I do all these things. What about this other man? I won't even so much as raise his head to heaven, beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, which of these two went to his house justified? The one who knew he was lost and knew he needed God's mercy and grace. Not the man who thought he was right, but the one who knew he was wrong. Jesus is the friend to the one in sin because they're the very people Jesus came to heal. Luke 19.10, Jesus vividly states his mission when he says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Those who are in sin are the ones he came to save. You see, sin is that disease. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, it's likened unto a, a cancer, a gangrene maybe. Psalm 38, verse number 4. Psalm 37, verse 25, it goes over our head like a heavy burden. We can't bear it in and of ourselves. Luke 17, verse 10, as Jesus taught about being thankful and gives an illustration of the, the ten lepers, one came back gave glory to God. Those are the people God is looking to save, the ones who desperately need Him and His mercy and His grace. But you know, Jesus is also a, a friend of sinners, the one lost in sin who wants to be saved. He's a friend to that person because Jesus can teach them how to overcome a life of sin. He's the perfect one, really. He's the only one qualified to do that because He lived a life above reproach. Remember Hebrews 4.15? Tempted all points as we are, yet without sin. If you were going to find a great teacher, you'd want one who was the premier person to teach about this. How can Jesus be that premier person to teach us how to overcome sin? Because He lived just like you and me. He faced the problems we do. He, dealt, he was dealt temptation. Matthew 4 verses 1 through 11. He had spent 40 days in the wilderness. Satan tempts Him. Everything Satan can throw at Him. Satan does it. And Jesus overcame the temptation of Satan. He's qualified to help teach us how to overcome sin. Jesus, or the Bible says in 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or all that is in the world. Lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They're not of the Father, but of the evil one. And, and the world and all that's in it is passing away, but he who does the will of God will last or live forever. How can Jesus teach me to overcome sin? Same way he did it. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, It is written, it is written, it is written. By realizing how Satan works, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, I can have the, the, the tools, the ability to overcome just as Jesus himself overcame. And so when we think about what makes him qualified, no one could be a better example than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is why Paul would say, imitate me as far as I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, I am to walk in the footsteps of the Lord and Savior. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. And I'm to let my light shine as I live for Jesus as an example each and every day. I'm not to be overcome with the world, but I am to overcome the world through Christ. Do not be deceived, Paul will say. Godliness and worldliness, they cannot go hand in hand. You can't have both. You've got to stay true to Jesus and His teaching. Now, as we think about this idea, understanding more about Jesus and His love for those lost in sin, we want to think about the question, how is it that Jesus showed His friendship to sinners? Friendship isn't just a word you throw around. It's an action. It's a part of life. It's a, a quality or a characteristic that is, that is seen and visible. How did Jesus show His friendship to those lost in sin who wanted to be saved? 
Friend, Jesus didn't do it in some of the ways people maybe think we should today. Jesus didn't show friendship by tolerating sin. You know, we live in a world today where sometimes people say, if you're my friend, you can overlook these things. Well, wait a minute now. There's no doubt that all of us make mistakes, but tolerating sin and allowing someone to live in it, that's not real friendship. John chapter 4, to the woman at the well, Jesus clearly pointed out, you've had these many husbands and the one you've got right now, he's not. He's not your husband. You were living in sin and you need to overcome that. Uh, to the woman in adultery, again, Jesus pointed out those things and, and both of those people we're indeed appreciative of Jesus saying that. You know, Jesus doesn't show His friendship in the way that sometimes people of the world think we ought to do it today, by never saying anything that would offend anyone. You know, we live in a society that is so concerned about never offending anybody that sometimes it's hard to get what people really think out. That's not the way Jesus was. Jesus wasn't so concerned about not offending as he was about making sure people knew God's truth and could be saved. Did he preach the truth in love? Are we supposed to do that? Absolutely. Ephesians 4.15 teaches that. And yet it was Jesus who to the hard-hearted Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees who had overlooked God's law, Jesus boldly said, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Mark chapter 12, verse number 24. You know, Jesus didn't show his friendship by having just the good old neighbor mentality. Oh, they're just good old people. That's just the way they are, the way they've always been. And we just kind of got to go along to get along. We've got to live peacefully by everybody and not rock the boat. Again, that wasn't Jesus' mentality. Jesus' mentality was there are two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was committed to God and His truth, and He was committed to loving His neighbor, which at times meant Jesus had to say things that on the outset people might think uh, are not the most friendly, but if you look at His motives and you see what He's trying to do, Jesus was indeed their best friend. And so how is it Jesus shows His love to the sinner? Friend, Jesus exhibited this in the most wonderful exhibit you could ever imagine, wonderful way you can ever think of. Jesus shows His love to sinners by His ultimate and sacrificial death on the cross. 1 Peter 2.24 says it this way, He Himself, Jesus Himself, bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. How do I know the Lord loves sinners today, that he, that he loves me and He loves you? Jesus sacrificed Himself. He gave up His life, went through horrible suffering, beaten, mocked, spit upon, laughed at, uh, ridiculed as the Son of God, hung in agony on a cruel Roman cross until He struggled for His very last breath and said, It is finished. Why did He do that? Because He loves sinners more than we can probably ever begin to comprehend. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 that God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. John 1 verse 29, as John saw Jesus approaching, he said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was manifest in these last times for us. He is the one who, although the Jews had put their trust in tradition, things of the world, Jesus really made that sacrifice available. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9. This man, Christ, after he made one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. How, do you, how can you know Christ loves sinners? Look at what He suffered and look at what He did so that we could have the hope of heaven. Friend, we also know that Jesus loved sinners because He was willing to come to this earth and teach them the truth about salvation. Again, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. 
Jesus taught those things that we know are true and right. Truth on the way to the Father. That there's only one way. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, oh, there are two paths. Yes, there are two paths. One broad path, one with a wide path, a broad gate that leads to eternal destruction. And then there is that narrow path, that restricted path. Few are going down it that leads to eternal life. What did Jesus teach about salvation that shows His love? He clearly taught the one way to get to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. Jesus clearly taught that truth was the way to be free. Do you remember John chapter 8, verse 32? Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We live in a world that kind of wants to deny that there is any definite truth. But friend, when we think about that, that in and of itself is utterly ridiculous. There have always been truths. Two plus two will always be four, no matter where you are in the world. If you drop a steel ball, it's always going to go down. Why? Gravity. Truths that we cannot deny. And friend, Jesus came and taught the truth about truth, Himself being the way to salvation. Jesus taught the truth about life, the best life here and now, John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. But more than just now, Jesus taught the truth about eternal life. That there is a day coming when all men, all of us, will stand before the throne of God, will each give an account for the things done in the body, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, and will either hear two things said, well done to those who have lived faithfully, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord, or... Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus made both those statements in Matthew 25, and He came and taught the truth about how to have eternal life. My friend, as we think about Jesus illustrating, showing His love for those who are lost in sin, let's also realize Jesus is the friend of the sinner, and He demonstrates that because He came here to associate with sinners for the greatest cause in the world the salvation of lost souls. What's the most important thing that each of us has? What, what is it that we have that is more important than anything else? Our soul. Mark 8, 36 and 37, Jesus said, What will it profit a man? He gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? My soul and your soul. They're the most important thing that we have. And if I lose that, friend, I've lost it all. And so I know Christ loves me and He loves you because of what He sacrificed, because of what He taught, because look at His love that He shared with men and women while He was here. Look at the good that He did. Mark 7 verse 37 says, he, they said of Jesus, He's done all things well. He healed the sick. He fed the poor. He helped those who were hurting. He cast demons out of those who were possessed by them. And ultimately, He brought salvation, joy, hope, and, and comfort to those who were entangled by the snares of the devil. But you know, as we think about Jesus as a friend of sinners, I think there's no doubt He is, to the one lost in sin, the best friend they've ever had. And you can vividly see that by what he did. But you know, that friendship is a two-way street. I also want to be a friend to the Lord, to the one who is the great friend of sinners. I want to repay that friendship. I want to also be one who is worthy of friendship. What is it that we can do to be a friend to Jesus, the greatest friend we've ever had? Well, we need, first of all, to not have the mindset of the Pharisees that in Jesus' day were so ridiculing of the people around them. We don't want to have a mindset that we're better than everybody else. We don't want to have a mindset that Jesus came to be with the righteous and that these sinners in the slums, whoever they may be, they're not worthy of the Lord. Friend, that's not true. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We need the attitude and the mindset of let's take the gospel to the whole world. Let's not get caught up thinking we're better than others, that Christ came just to save us, or that people who are living this way, we don't even need to go talk to them. Friend, those are the very people 
we need to go and speak to. And so we want the mindset of going into all the world and preaching the gospel, the message of salvation, and giving people that hope. You know, to be a friend to Jesus, I need to remember. I was at one time lost in sin, and I desperately needed God's grace. Ephesians 2 verse 1, You He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I've been in that place. Maybe you've obeyed the gospel and you've been in that place. To be a friend to Jesus, I need to realize and be reminded of exactly what He did to save mankind. And friend, it's that reminder, it's, it's thinking about that that motivates me through my desire to obey Jesus and really be the type of friend that, needs, that He wants me to be. To go take the gospel to the lost. Go into all the world. Mark 16, 50. Uh, Ezekiel 33, to sound the trumpet, to let the message be heard far and wide. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Why do Christians want to take the message of Christ to the world? Because they love the Lord and they want others to know about His hope and His joy that is made available. And friend, it's this idea that motivates us to encourage you, to encourage all men about salvation. Have you really accepted? Have you obeyed the gospel of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I will promise you this. If you're living in the depths of sin, you know what that's like. Sin is a burden that you cannot bear alone. Whatever the sin is, you need Christ. The greatest friend that anyone lost in sin has ever had, and I can assure you he can bring you out of those depths and give you joy beyond measure. Will you obey Christ? Will you become a Christian? Friend, it's not hard. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they heard the message about Jesus as the Son of God. Acts 2 verse 36. They responded to that message in belief and repentance. Peter preached, repent and be converted. Acts 3 verse 19. Those who gladly received that word they were baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts 2 verse 38, And the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. And so today, our hope, our desire, is for each person to see that Jesus truly is the friend to the one who's lost in sin and wants to be saved. Won't you let Him save you today? by obeying His gospel. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. With his pride, this is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.